Last call for raffle tickets. If you want raffle tickets, come see me. Shutting down in about three minutes.
Great man. I can't see my British friend I know, nearly 200. Yes, indeed. Anybody looking at their watches knows it's not 12.15, but we've got so much going on. I thought you would at least grant me the latitude to start a minute or two early. I hope you've had a wonderful meal, fabulous food, and good conversation. So I have Coyote Erickson coming up, and he's going to give us the pledge. He's been with us since January this year. He's a CPA, was a CPA in private practice. He studied at the Golden Gate University School of Law and Pacific Graduate Institute. So, Coyote. Coyote is over here. He's coming. While we're waiting for Coyote, I just want to note that I love knowing that some of my daughter's friends are in the audience becoming members here because it shows that it's bringing down the average age of our club tremendously. <laughs> And every mistake I make will humorously be given back to my daughter who will laugh at me. Coyote, come. It's getting better. Come, come to the microphone. Thank you, Zach, by the way. I <laughs> pledge allegiance. And we're supposed to introduce the, uh, it's a video. We now have a video, yes. Washington. 
<laughs> Before my good friend joins us, I just want to welcome back Pat Zumbush. Wave your hand wherever you are, Pat. Oh, yeah, oh, fabulous, he's back. Oh, surgery, but good on you. Thank you for being back here. It's really great to see that you're recovering. Now, Dan Calm, my ever-present Sergeant at Arms, <laughs> is going to, to be with us. He's been with us since 2020. Thank you, ma'am. That's all right, <laughs> So the inspiration today, please have a seat. We'll start with that. Please be seated. The inspiration today is this. Some people get addicted to chain smoking their problems. They spend all day going from sorrow to sorrow, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can live each day going from joy to joy, like a sunflower that turns the face to sun as it moves across the sky. It's not about having a problem-free life, but about focusing on the light. Sunflowers still have shadows, but they're always behind them. Okay, so I'm here to introduce the guests, and we have a lot of guests, and you all look fabulous from up here. Look at all the red, look at everything going. When you join our club, not only do you join our club, but you make friends, and not only do you make friends, but you get to make a difference. So if you see somebody with a badge, and you want to potentially think about joining our club or look at our club as a potential for membership, we'd encourage you, we are looking for members. And so making a difference, making friends, how much better does it get than that? Now, for all of you at home, you can't stand up, but for those of you here who are guests, if you would please stand up so we can recognize you. Everybody who's a guest, stand up. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. And now I have one more function, and my one last function is the raffle. We're, uh, we're uh, chaining this all together today. So uh, Coach Brennan, since you picked a winner, I'm going to let you pick another winner. <laughs> Note, if you didn't win, it's Coach Brennan's fault. <laughs> Number 447 <laughs> 6 Mike Anderson, we buy raffle tickets. Coach, if you would uh, pick a card. Mike Anderson, you were close. You got the queen of, of uh, clubs, or not clubs, uh, diamonds. And that's it. Good on you, mate. Just a quick note, all we Rotarians know we know several things, that so we're always trying to collect money for good works and for service projects. One of the ways that we collect money is if somebody's phone rings, we find them $100. Now, normally, of course, we wouldn't do that for guests, but since we've got so many guests, and since we really want lots of money, all of you switch your phones on now, and we'll find you all, all right? <laughs> You'll be in trouble. Now, this is totally out of order, but we're doing it so we've got lots of time for Coach Brennan. So, for start off, all members of the club, please stay after the meeting because we are going to have our club photograph. It'll be hard to distinguish one person from another because we're all wearing red. We'll give it a go. So, please stay after the meeting for the club photo. Next, we have Vicki Jacobs. She's got a minute or two to talk about March Madness. Hi, Hang on, microphone, microphone coming down. Oh, look, he's training, he's training. He wants to be chosen by. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Next week, we announce the winners of March Madness, all right? And the application deadline is Monday at 5 o'clock. So if you're thinking about joining, please put your membership application in by Monday. All right? We want it regardless, but Monday it's for our competition. Bear down. And I'm now going to invite Bob Logan to come up because he has something very, very special. Thank you, President Margaret. Um, we do have a special presentation today. And before I get into that, she had asked me about, since we have so many new members and guests and people are thinking about joining, to talk about the importance of fellowships that we have within the Rotary Club of Tucson. 
So if you have different interests, we have a wine fellowship. If you like wine, there we go. There we go. And we have a whiskey fellowship. Uh, there we go. We have a beer fellowship. I'm not sure if it's still active. but uh, So for those thinking about joining, obviously you have to drink. All right? That's what we do around here. But we do have a hiking fellowship to work off the hangover from the whiskey and the beer and the wine. And we have a book fellowship so you can read about the dangers of drinking. And, then, and we have a golf fellowship. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We have a golf fellowship with over 35 members. And I'd like the golf fellowship people who are in the room, please stand up real quick. There we go. Thank you. Each year in the springtime, we have a, a tournament called the Rotary Club of Tucson World Match Play Championship. It sounds much bigger than it actually is because it's held at Del Uric Golf Course. Um, I'd like to bring up the current chair of the Golf Fellowship, Bruce Tunsey and Jim Lubinsky. Hello, Jim. Hey, Bruce. Bob's told me to make it quick, so we are here today to award this, whoa, <laughs> impressive trophy <laughs> to Mr. Jim Lubinsky, who won last year's the 2023 World Match Play Championship. <laughs> it's the fourth annual tournament, and Jim is our first two-time winner. He was the inaugural winner. He repeated last year, and... Uh, so we're all after you this year, Jim. So congratulations. Thanks, Bruce. You're welcome. Take care. Congratulations, Jim. Our golf fellowship has uh, been running for about seven, eight years under the leadership of our own Wayne Meyer. And we call him our commissioner and our coach. Wayne's going to be 90 years old this summertime, and so he decided to pass the baton on to Bruce. So, Bruce, thank you for taking the baton. But... I got to tell you what Wayne has done every two weeks for the past eight years. He calls the courses and gets the tee times. He sends out a notice to the golf fellowship, gets the emails back, arranges the, the foursomes by handicap, collects money for the skins in the contest prior. If he's not playing, he comes back four hours later when everybody comes in to award the prizes and give out the money. He keeps a spreadsheet on all the scores and the handicap so it's fair. He has a binder of golf tips and books that he shares with all of us shitty golfers. Excuse my French there. <laughs> he does provide personal coaching. In fact, uh, Roger Harwell and John Wong and Chuck Sawyer have used uh, Wayne for some coaching. And Wayne, as much as we love your coaching, those players still suck, just so you know. <laughs> Needless to say... It has been a labor of love for Wayne for the past seven, eight years. And to show our appreciation for you, we thought we would give you a parting gift from the Golf Fellowship, okay? And we called out to the fellowship. We said, you know, we'd like to raise a little bit of money and give him a gift. And from the group, we did a small collection. It's not a big deal. And I'd like these eight people to come up and present Wayne uh, part of the proceeds. Bruce Tunsey, Chuck Sawyer, Bobby Larson, Nancy Stockton, work your way over to Wayne, please. Brett Stein, Roger Harwell, Bruce Jacobs, and Ken Light. You may want to look inside, Wayne. So to take away the surprise, each of those envelopes hold a $100 bill. Wayne, turn around, get your photo, get your money and turn around. There you go. Turn around, Wayne. <laughs> Congratulations, Wayne Meyer. You need a microphone, microphone over here. All right, thank you very much, Ron, Dan. Coach Brennan will definitely employ you. No problem. Hustle. 
Just, just quickly. Is it on? Okay. So, Wayne, my friend, you've helped dozens of Rotarian and other golfers improve their game, and if not their game, their love of the game, while enhancing friendships and good fellowship. You've managed high finance, mathematical handicap calculations, and various egos. And when I think of you, I think of a couple quick definitions of the game, including an endless series of tragedies obscured by the occasional miracle. <laughs> the art of losing a small white ball in sand, water, and vegetation. A lot of walking broken up by disappointment and poor arithmetic. <laughs> or as Mark Twain is reported to have said, golf is a good walk, spoiled. <laughs> Regardless of the definition, it is the consensus of the group herein gathered that you deserve all the accolades we can assemble as we present you with a small token of our appreciation and esteem. Many folks know that you've had your share of health challenges, but what they may not know is that with older golfers, one of the challenges is with the eyes, and older golfers seem to have trouble finding their balls. So therefore, hey, I didn't, I'm just reading. <laughs> We have for you a pair of visible glasses. I hope they help, but in any event, we look forward to seeing you. And these glasses, I'm, these are, this is true. They're blue, and they're called visibles. <laughs> Even with instructions. Okay, photographs of you wearing them, Wayne. Put them on. Thanks, Ken. That's terrific. Wayne, you've done us proud in the club. Thank you so much. 90 years old. Impossible to believe. And now, moving on, we have Jen and Sean Hoffman. Intro for the 2025 Car Show Chair. Okay, keep running. He might employ you too, Jen. Come on. I got a little sprint in there, too. So it's time for the guessing game, y'all. Who is going to be the next Tucson Classics car show chair? This person hail, hails from rural Southern California, but at the age of 17, decided to skip town and never looked back. This person moved to Tucson after college, marriage and kids in 1985. And speaking of marriage and kids, this person will celebrate their 50th year of connubial bliss while car show chair. This person is a proud parent of two sons and six grandchildren, and he, they are lucky enough to um, have all living in Tucson. This person personally owned and restored a 1948 Ford F-150 truck that was bought for a whopping $100. As a teenager and purchased a 1941 Packard convertible coupe that was sold prior to complete restoration in order to purchase a house in 1971. A former pastor, this person is dedicated to fostering spiritual growth and community outreach initiatives. This person is also a seasoned entrepreneur and innovator as the owner of a company that specializes in the design and manufacturing of replacement parts for mining and industrial machinery, demonstrating a keen business acumen and engineering prowess. This person has been a member of our Rotary Club since 2013, being drawn to Rotary by our ethics and our service above self. Leading our car show ticket, chair, <laughs> ticket event sales efforts at local events for the past nine years, his personal motto is, small things done with big love can change the world, one person at a time. I am proud, what, any guesses? Hey, as you guys can tell, Dave White is our next car show chair. Um, a man who has many shirts designed specifically for this role. Absolutely fabulous. That was a great TV show, by the way, Ab Fab. Dave, brilliant. Look forward to it. Uh, and now I'm going to take a moment to introduce Mike Anderson and Micah Cole. As you can see, 
they sponsored this luncheon today. It was a specific one they wanted to, to sponsor because of the number of people. Mike Anderson has been with us for many, many years. Every year he has supported the car show. He's, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're an absolute asset, an icon, Mike. Thank you for being with us. Not only that, and it wasn't rigged, he won the raffle. I don't understand <laughs> that. But I'd, li I'd like Micah to speak about the car shows. Micah Cole. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Micah Cole, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about WeBuyHouses.com. My father, Michael Anderson, uh, and um, my, my father, Michael Anderson, has been a member of this club for 43 years and was its club president in 2000. WeBuyHouses.com has been the title sponsor of Rotary's Tucson Classic Car Show for the last 12 years. My brother, Zach, is our company president and manages our daily operations. We work together as a family, buying, renovating, and selling approximately 50 to 100 houses a year and managing our 300 home rental portfolio. <clears throat> we are excited and proud of our business model. We believe it provides a winning solution for all parties involved. We buy distressed, rundown, fire damaged, vandalized, hoarder or vacant houses, primarily in the Tucson city limits. We pay sellers all cash. We then professionally renovate these homes with new roofs, kitchens, baths, windows, heating and cooling, landscaping, making them literally like new. We pay our team of employees and subcontractors a good living wage. Most of our employees have been with us for decades. We then resell beautifully remodeled homes, often to first time home buyers, and in most cases, pay their down payment and closing costs. Rundown, <clears throat> rundown houses are a blithe, and through our efforts, we revitalize and restore neighborhood pride. We have bought and renovated over 2,000 Tucson houses, and will celebrate our 50th year in business next year. <laughs> Rotary has instilled a strong sense of service and philanthropy in our company and family. I would like to give you a few examples. Despite, <clears throat> despite being a business-oriented family, my parents strongly supported my career where I spent 13 years as a third grade teacher prior to joining our company. <laughs> Zach, with the support of our company, volunteered as a Little League coach for the last 10 years and last year, his team represented Arizona at the Little League World Series. <laughs> My father is passing on his giving philosophy to his grandchildren. We periodically hold family retreats where six of his young grandchildren sit at a round table, hear presentations about various nonprofits. These grandkids then pool their allowances, make their donations to the winning nonprofits. In recent years, our business has given substantial amounts to local organizations, including Teen Challenge, Boy Scouts, Right Flight, the Rotary Club Foundation, and many more. I'm privileged to represent my family and our company. We Buy Houses is honored to support and sponsor today's luncheon. From a U of A alum, bear down and go cats. Thank you. Micah, that is absolutely fabulous, and I have to let you know, although I've known Mike Anderson and the work he's done for many years, I've never actually known the breadth and depth of the work that you actually do professionally. That's fabulous, and it goes a long way to helping Tucson with its um, homeless, low-income population. Thank you. And your grandchildren. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, thank you. And they sponsored today, so I think another round of applause is, is well warranted. <laughs> We're getting to the program, and we're getting there rather quickly, but I am going to take 30 seconds, I hope, to introduce the person who's going to introduce Coach Brennan. Now, you all remember last week when we had Haggis, and we had Sawaros, and we had me being born in Scotland. Well, I thought that perhaps I would give a very brief response or rebuttal. <laughs> Introducing Bob Logan, per chat GPT. It took one second to do him. Three seconds for me, one second for him. Bob Logan 
hailing from the sun-drenched deserts of Tucson, Arizona, is not your ordinary motivational speaker, unless you count his unparalleled ability to inspire cacti to strive for greater heights. <laughs> With a voice as smooth as a saguaro's skin, <laughs> and a wardrobe that screams, Desert chic, <laughs> Bob has been known to captivate audiences by simply mentioning the word hydration. I could go on, but I'm going to let him come up now and do the real introduction. But Bob, there you go, chat GPT. As they say, what goes around comes around, right? So I've been taking a lot of heat since I showed up. Uh, Bob, how come you're not wearing red? Well, my wife said that black is slimming, and then John Wong says my wife is wrong, so that was kind of disappointing. <laughs> now, Coach Brennan, just so you know, a couple of weeks ago when you couldn't make it, we were able to listen to Coach Alonzo Carter. And I will tell you, Alonzo Carter hit it out of the park. Am I right? So the bar is really high. Don't screw this up today, okay? I want to give kudos to you and your staff. Last time, uh, we had a bunch of coaches, and today they came again. We had Ben Thenis for the chief of staff, Ricky Hunley, Chuck Cecil, and Brandon Sanders. Thanks again for coming to visiting and sticking around with our Rotary Club. So this must have been an important meeting because Greg Hansen's in the room, so I'm expecting some love in the Sunday notes, okay? Okay, I'm going to dispense with all the football stuff about Coach Brennan, except that he took San Jose State to three bowl games in four years. That alone says the guy can coach. What I do want to talk about is the type of person that Brent Brennan is. And when, you know, the other guy left for Washington, many people thought that the program was going to collapse, that Noah and T-Mac were going to go away. And I had heard that they were offered millions of dollars at other schools to go to other schools, and then they met him. And they learned about the family and the culture and the type of experience that they're going to have. And they stayed. And they stayed because of him. So congratulations for what you're doing with the current team. Now, I've lived through John Makovic. Um, I've lived through Mike Stoops and the ranting on the sidelines. Uh, Rich Rod, and I'm a defensive guy. Rich Rod, great offense, no defense, which was not fun for me to watch. I can't say the name of this coach, but all I can say is 70 to 7. And then the, I promise I'm not going anywhere, Jed Fish. Um, but I always come back to the coach that we all loved, and that is Dick Tomey. And Dick Tomey was a great person, but a great coach. He was tough, he was fair, he spoke from the heart, and he was not afraid to say, I love you. And I know much you feel about Coach Tomey and how he has helped you in your development and what you are today as a coach. So from one man's position... I just got to say, if you bring back any of the semblance of the Dick Tomey days back to Arizona football, you got a lot of people in this community going to be really happy and proud. So with that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, fellow Rotarians, please welcome our U of A head football coach, Brent Brennan. All right. Enough already. Uh, it's really neat for me to be here. I just have the incredible amount of respect for the Rotarians everywhere. Uh, during my time as a head coach, I've spoken to so many different Rotary groups in California, right? There's like 10 cities the size of Tucson, right? And then a million uh, different Rotary groups in, in all the suburbs and all the different pieces. So it was really fun. The, the, a couple of things that I've always uh, respected is the outward looking kind of outward facing service component of, of of the Rotary. I, I just think that's a really special thing. I think uh, we're living in a world right now where people sit around and complain and blame and waste time doing nothing, but like Rotarians everywhere are all actively doing something and finding a way to contribute to the greater good. And I think that is really, really special. And so I, I really appreciate you all having me here today. I will say this is the largest Rotary group I've ever spoken to. Yeah. <laughs> It is so cool for me to be back at the U of A. My, uh, my career kind of started here 
in 2000 when I was working for Coach Tomey. Um, you know, it, it's fun to be on staff with, with Chuck, Cecil, and Rick Hunley, right? Like, those are the one, those are the guys who are like Michael Jackson walking around town here. Like, it's crazy. Like, I don't, I don't meet anybody that they're, they're just like, how's Chuck doing or how's Ricky? Uh, it's really amazing. And then for me, though, the one I remember is Brandon Sanders because Brandon and I are the same age. And, and he was a bad man. Now, like, on a football field, I was a receiver at UCLA that never played in the games. But I was an aspiring coach, so I watched a lot of film. And this is the Desert Swarm era of Arizona football. And Brandon was full assaulting people in, on the field, <laughs> like, like few people I've ever seen. And he's such an incredible like, teammate now. And he's such a kind and like, nice man. And I'm like, this guy is nothing like the guy I remember from 1993. Uh, that guy was a cold-blooded killer out there. He really was. Um, but it, it is really special for me to be back here, obviously with the Coach Tomey legacy um, in, in my experience with, with, with Dick. And then also when you look at our staff, you know, the guys that are coaching with us, whether that's Dwayne Aquina or Dino Babers or Bobby Wade that played for Coach Tomey. And then I already mentioned the three that are here. It's really important to me that we have people in the program that were part of the program. That's a really, really important thing to me. I think at one point that got lost here. But I think the people that care the most about it are the people that kind of spilled blood for it. And so I think it's really, really important that we have these guys actively engaged in the program and trying to help us build a consistent winner here. Um, I've been uh, gently scolding uh, people that I've been, groups that I've been talking to lately because everybody seems to keep wanting to talk about the past. And I just want to talk about the future. Um, I'm much more interested in looking out the windshield than I am the rear view. And because we can't change what's behind us, but we can certainly change what's in front of us. And that's where I've been absolutely focused with our team, with our staff, and with every group I've spoken to. Because there always seems to be this component about Jed, but I'm happy for Jed. Jed and I are friends. Way to go. He took a different business opportunity that he's excited about. And thank God, because now I'm here. <laughs> like, you know, so. As far as I'm concerned, this is working out great. Um, but I am, I am having a great time. We had our first practice yesterday. Uh, so, you know, just to give you guys, let, let me rewind a second, I'm sorry. Uh, when I became a head coach in 2017 at San Jose State, there was, uh, there was no transfer portal. There was no NIL, right? These things weren't part of college football. That made this transition incredibly different than my first one as a head coach. In this transition, it was much more inwardly focused and about retention of the current roster. Um, now, it was nice of you both to give me credit for those kids staying at the U of A, but those kids did that on their own. Like those kids, they were really connected. The, the young men that you spoke of have incredible leadership. They have incredible, they, they're very connected. And I believe they're connected because they went through hard times together. Those first couple years with Jed were really, really hard. We went through a similar transition at San Jose, so I kind of know how that feels. I have some experience with that. But they chose to stay for each other, which I think is the best thing we have going for us is that these guys are really connected and they really want to do this for each other. And so when I got the job, it was about me getting to know them and them getting to know me and the new coaches that I was bringing on board. And it was a hectic time because it was also, there was also a recruiting cycle that was happening at the same time. Um, and so, but I couldn't leave town knowing that the current roster could still leave. Like that didn't make sense to me or to our staff. We felt like the most important players that we could get to play for the U of A next fall were the players that were currently on our campus and already here. And so to go be chasing something out of some other, you know, some other city or some other state didn't make sense because the most important thing was retaining the current roster we had. And so that's what we dove into. So it's been a two and a half month process of getting to know each other. It's been a lot of fun. The strength and conditioning has been fantastic. And then we finally got to get on the field yesterday, which was awesome. Um, and it was fun. Now we're just in helmets. And, you know, even though Coach Cecil is here, um, like, we don't allow contact in helmets and, and, and no pads. Um, you know, so we had to keep Chuck on the side, you know. Like, or, uh, but but it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. to just, it, I would say it was almost cathartic being out on the field and just getting back to football. Like, that was just like, let's just go play football and run around and just have fun playing the game that we all love. And that's what yesterday was. And it was really, really fun. It's day one of spring practice. We got 14 left. 
Um, we're in the process of still trying to fill out our roster with recruiting and, you know, the kind of the goings-ons of college football. We're, we have a, on April 15th, just to give you guys, if you don't know, some background, on April 15th, another transfer portal opens, and it goes till April 30th. So the retention of our current roster is still more important than chasing anything outside of our roster that we might chase. So it's a very, very different time in, in college football. I, I know a lot of people in this room, a lot of people in town have gone to great lengths to help us support our players through NIL and the collective and all those things. And I will tell you, it is absolutely important. Um, I don't want this to be a commercial for that, but I'm just telling you, college football is becoming transactional um, the same way pro sports are, right? Just they're going, players are going to the highest bidder. And, and because there's no salary cap in college football, that the people with the biggest wallet can take all the best players, right? It's really interesting, right? If you, if you look at it through the lens of the NFL, the NFL does an incredible job of protecting football. If you're the last place team in the NFL, you get the first pick. You also get the easiest schedule the next season. Pretty good, right? You also have tampering laws so that the richest owner can't just go take, you know, Patrick Mahomes and Derrick Henry and the best players in pro football and say, come pay for me, we'll pay you more than anybody else. Again, they protect the game of football. Right. And then each organization has a salary cap that they have to operate under. Salary cap is set at this and you can't spend over this on your roster. But there's nothing like that in college football, which is making it incredibly interesting. And so everyone is trying to find the best way to navigate that space. And that's what we're doing, too, um, currently at the U of A. The good news is, is we have had a ton of people step up. We've had the community step up and help support those support those efforts. But if you know people that are interested in helping in that way, please help. Please help, because that's the world we're living in. And everybody had, everybody so enjoyed last year, did we not? Yeah, come on, man. Come on. I wasn't here, but I know you guys enjoyed it. Right? And, and so the sustainability is the challenge. The con winning consistently is the challenge. I really think that, that doing it one time, and I, and I learned this firsthand at San Jose State, uh, doing it one time, like that, that can happen. Our, our, our fourth year at San Jose State, we went undefeated, won the conference. It was awesome. It's like magical thing. San Jose State hadn't won a conference championship for 35 years, I think. So it's this incredible thing. But the next year we were five and seven because we weren't ready to sustain it. We weren't ready to keep continuing to, to elevate it and push it and drive it. And so that's what we're focused on right now with, with our team here. Because out in the community, everyone's telling our team how good they are, right? When you see Noah Fafita walking you know, downtown on 4th for, you know, going to Bison Witches or something. You're like, hey, way to go, Noah, right? Great season, right? So every player is experiencing that. And the same thing happened to us at San Jose. So I'm working on helping the players to get more focused on the process. Like, how did you get here? Like, you got here by working hard at it every single day. You got here by not looking six months, eight months in advance. You got here by worrying about right now. And that's what we focus, we pull, pull on our team back right now to, or in, in our process to just focus on today, this meeting, this practice, this lift, whatever we're doing in that moment so that we can hopefully continue to stack really good days and let that kind of, you know, gain some momentum so that we're ready for the football season when it gets here. So that's the challenge that we're going through right now. Roster management, spring practice, recruiting, fundraising, all of it. It never, never stops. The best part that I'm experiencing being back at the U of A is how much the city of Tucson loves the U of A. It's like, it's really, really unique. It, it, I, I've coached, I coach at Oregon State, which is a much smaller town, right? There's like awesome experience, but there's only like 50,000 people in the city of Corvallis. And the next biggest city is Eugene. It's an hour away where the ducks are. We don't like them. And, <laughs> and, and, and they got about 100,000 people. Right, but you got to go to Portland to get any really big city, and that's 90 miles from us. So, way different. Where here you have a city of roughly a million people, I think that's right, and the U of A is the only show in town, which is really, really special. I think our players feel that. You know, obviously, our, our students feel that, and I think that's one of the things that's compelling for anyone choosing to come go to school here or come be a student athlete here because of how well they are received in the community. It is really, really special, and I thank you all for loving the U of A that much and showing up for these kids and, and for all of our athletic teams. It's really, really important, and it makes us totally different than most everybody that I've ever coached for or against in college football. So it's really, really cool. So thank you for showing up that way because it is unique to this town and to the University of Arizona. 
we have, uh, let's see, coming up, we have, I'm going to give you all a couple questions, um, or a couple minutes for questions. Coming up, we have, in the summer, we have camps. So if you have young people, with children, grandkids, friends, whatever, we'll have camps for youth. We'll have camps for high school kids going on. You know, we want to make, make sure that we get people out for that. Uh, we also have our spring game on April 27th. And we'll have a ton of like football alums coming back for that. That'll be a really great, great event. Um, just, just forewarning, it's the first time ever that we have charged admission to that game. And so just be aware, it's going to be, I think it's $5. $10? $5 for season ticket holders, $10 for general Okay, $5 for season ticket holders and, and $10 for the general public. Okay, so, but I'm just getting that out there so you're not surprised. When, when you get there, you're like, what the hell? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want that to happen. I mean, oh, come on in. You know, we want you all there. Um, but I, I do think we really have a great group of young men, a, a group that needs your support, and a, and a group that will really respond to you guys showing up for them on game day. Because as you're looking at our, our new conference, I think that's one of the things that's been interesting. I don't think, I don't think our players, our fans, um, even, you know, a lot of, don't have a great understanding of what the Big 12 is which it's a fantastic football conference. And it comes with a lot of places that we've never played before, we've never coached before. Good news, we have Dwayne Aquino on our staff and he coached at Texas for 14 years. So he's played in all these venues and he's gonna help us with, you know, you know do we wanna kick it off from this side or that side? You know, all the tricks that you learn in the stadium. But it's gonna be new for our players. It's gonna be new for our team. And, and so there, I think there's a lot of excitement about that. And I know that when we go play at TCU, the crowd is going to be rowdy. When we go play Kansas State, the crowd is going to be crazy. And we need the city of Tucson, our alums, our fans, and our students to make sure that when these teams come to us, that Arizona Stadium is rocking. Like, it needs to be the hardest place to play in the conference. And so we need all of your help to do that. All right? All right, we up for a couple questions? Is that okay? And, and coach, in my opinion, you are the right man for right now. And I really believe that. The other thing is I do bleed red and blue because my senior year, and by the way, I was buying season tickets even when I was going to graduate school at Northwestern in Evanston. I'd buy season tickets, hand them out to friends and family. God bless you for But that. my senior year at Arizona, I was... Wilbur the Wildcat. Hey. Bear down, Arizona. That was awesome. Hi, Hi Coach. Coach B. Uh, first of all, I understand your birthday was last week, so happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> I think you had lunch with me on my birthday. I, I yes. did have lunch with you that day. Um, so I remember that 2020 season. Yes. when San Jose State won the championship because you were invited to the Arizona Bowl and yes. played here. So it was, it was an amazing um, time to have you here. But my question is about this. You have such a um, love for Coach Tomey, and you and I have talked about this a couple times offline. Tell us about your efforts to get Coach Tomey into the Hall of Fame. Oh, man. I'm not sure this is for public consumption. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, it's out there now, right? I'm not putting the genie back in the bottle. Um, yeah, no, so I think one of my things about Coach Tomey is I, that's so special was that he won at places that weren't always at the top of the food chain. You know, he won at Hawaii, he won at San Jose State, he won consistently here at U of A, which hasn't happened with that kind of consistency since he left, right? Uh, and so, um, and but with some of those places, I think there, there's some, there were some inherent challenges. I know firsthand at San Jose State, there were things built in that were just kind of things that we were constantly trying to fix. I was there with him during that time. And so because of, because of his taking over at San Jose State, that knocked his all-time winning percentage below the, uh, yeah, below the 60%, right? And, um, and so I did, I did go after them pretty hard. It, it, was, it was in a private setting, but it was aggressive. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. And I, I was just fighting for a guy who I just thought was an incredible person for college football for 40 years or however long he coached for. Um, and I think, you know, every at each one of those schools that he was at, he left an incredible mark where he impacted young men. He impacted the university. I mean, look how many people tonight or today have talked about Coach Tomey just in the hour we've been together. Um, and, and so that – like I'm still fighting for him that way. You know, I, I think – um, just having a hard and fast line that way, I, I don't think that tells the whole story. And, and so hopefully someday we will get him in there because I think he absolutely belongs. Hey, Coach, welcome aboard. Thank you. I have to tell you, you gave a very good presentation in regard to what the NFL is doing on salary caps. Hey, man, somebody just got 100 bucks. Get it up. Get it up. Anyway, what I'm, my question is really simple. Is the NCAA looking into putting some kind of cap on this NIL stuff, or is this just going to go on and on? This is not fair to you guys to have to struggle to keep your players without some oversight somewhere. I think that's a fair question, and I think um, I, I think we're going to go – I don't know that the NCA is going to be the one to regulate it. I think it's going to have to come from some sort of fe some sort of federal regulation. I think it's bigger than that, um, you know. And and the NCA doesn't really have real jurisdiction over human beings anyway, right? So I, I think like there there was a time where um, they were really hard and fast and set like firm lines on what you could and could not do, like when. When Ricky and Brandon and I and Chuck played, like you couldn't, like Coach Tomey couldn't buy Brandon a burger. Like he couldn't take him to McDonald's, you know, or a donor couldn't take Ricky to, you know, get a pizza. But now a donor could buy Ricky a car. You know, it's, it's a way different world we're living in. Yeah. Ricky's like, let's go. Yeah. yeah. No, but I, yeah, so it's definitely different. I, I really think it's going to, this is going to come down to like, like some hardcore law making and like this is a super big puzzle that people are trying to put together because I think people can see that the model is not sustainable and uh, being able to consistently like they're going to find a way that you know I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of t revenue sharing with television and like this this is a massive puzzle to put together the good news is I just have to coach a football team I don't have to figure all that out you know, so that's going to go to people way smarter than me. And at some point, hopefully, we get some determination that does give us a chance to um, return a little bit of parity to college football. I think that's what has made college football such a wonderful game, was that the games, were, the games are worth watching, right? And, like, you know, that's why the NFL is so fantastic, right? The 3-13 and 13 team looks good for three and a half quarters against the, you know, 13-3 and three team. You know, the parity forced by salary contract or salary cap, um, tampering rules, draft order, and schedule gives people a chance where those games are worth watching. And that's why the NFL is the most popular sport in America. And I want to keep college football up there. It's just number two right now. And I want to keep it there. But I think we got to find some regulation that helps make that stuff consistent across every team in the country. Everybody likes having you here. You talk about retention, did a great job on that. But if there are holes in the team, if you got to recruit, you got a window, what would be those areas that you're looking for, notwithstanding great players that you have? I would say every college football team in America, like coming out of spring practice, is looking for offensive and defensive linemen and corners. Everyone. Everyone. Just those, for whatever reason, those are just hard to find. And everybody's looking for those type, those big bodies and then people that can cover. And if you find somebody to sack, to sack the quarterback this late in the game, that would be like hitting the lottery. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm a guest here, Robert Charette with Parker & Sons. Wanted to uh, ask you, you mentioned that you're focusing on retention. Uh, could you give some details maybe on a macro and micro level of how you're uh, working on retention? Well, for starters, we just had to get to know each other, right? I, I think w the interesting thing is the, the day, the, w when this happened, this whole thing happened in like in less than 24 hours. And so I had to call a meeting with our team at San Jose State and meet with them and tell them that I was leaving. 
which was a really emotional thing. There have been seven years there. We had, you know, gone through lots of battles on and off the field. It was a really special group of young people there. It was a really special time in my life, being the head coach at San Jose. And so I had to go tell those kids I was leaving. And it was, a, it was I was a wreck. And it was really hard. And so, and then two hours later, I got on a plane to come here. And two hours later, I was talking to the team here. And so I was like, I kind of was able to be empathetic. Like I understood what they were going through because I had just done it four hours earlier with the team at San Jose. And so I was, I, I, I just started with them. I said, let's tr start with treating each other with respect and I will earn your trust over time, but we got to get to know each other. And, and that was kind of how we started. And so then the next few days I met with like a handful of the leadership team in my office. We sat down for like two hours and they, I just let them fire questions at me. It was really informal and really comfortable. And uh, that was kind of the starting of our getting to know each other. And then since then, we've done some stuff with our team. We've done some fun stuff off the field. We went to the rodeo as a team. Ricky was instrumental in getting us out there. It was so fun. All of our guys love putting on cowboy hats and getting dressed up. I don't know if any of them have ever even been on a horse. Um, <laughs> but uh, they sure enjoyed it. I know I'm not good on a horse. Me and horses are a no-go. Um, but it was a great experience. We had a blast out there. Um, you know, so we've done the stuff off the field is also, you know, so much so important as to what we're doing on the field in terms of that kind of that connection and us getting to know each other. Um, you know, so we had a couple meetings with the whole team kind of breaking out, talking about, uh, you know, stuff we need to do, stuff we want to keep doing, stuff we want to change. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, uh, as a leader or as a head coach, I'm, I'm listening to the players. Like, Coach Tomey taught me that, right? I might disagree, and at the end of the day, I might say, we're not going to do that. Like, I'm the head coach, and I need to make some of these decisions. But if they, there's input that I can take from them that makes their experience more valuable and better, then I'm going to do it. And so I'm going to take their input. And so that's been kind of good, getting us all on the same page, getting us together. And then I think our strength and conditioning coach has done a great job with that. Um, just It's been nine weeks of them really getting after it in the weight room. And he, his name's Colin Carroll, and he's fantastic. And so him and his staff, what they've been doing, and, and different this time of year because we're all new, the coaches have gone to every workout in the morning. They start at 6.30. And so the coaches have been out there every, four days a week with the team, which in a normal cycle, you wouldn't be. You'd be on the road recruiting, or you would just be sleeping. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but, but this time around, we've been out there every single day, and it's been good. Thank you. I would say two things about that. Number one, it doesn't surprise me that he told someone he's never met that he loves him because that that's that was Coach Tommy. But I'm actually not shocked at all that he rear-ended you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I drove I drove with Coach Tommy many times. It was always like you'd be walking in the car and it was like, "Hey, Coach, you want me to drive?" <laughs> Okay, two quick questions. First one is, um, hey, if we were to come to practice, would that be meaningful? We were invited last time. That's the first question. Always. Second question, okay. And, and what would we do when we, when we were there that would be meaningful? And secondly, we, that invitation came from your sub, and I asked him to do a little you know, rap dance, and he had nothing. So I wonder okay. if you could beat that. <laughs> well, what I found is that um, this job has given me new opportunities to publicly humiliate myself. So I'm trying to avoid that if I can. Um, I, I will say, uh, I think a lot of coaches currently are closing practice, and you know, in, across the country, um, we won't do that. I, I don't like. I want, I want fans, alums, whoever. I want people to come watch practice. Um, pe I've always had people say, like, aren't you giving your secrets away? I'm like, hey man, if, if they can't figure out what we're doing off of the film, we're we're fine. Like we're gonna be we're gonna be fine. You know, so. 
Um, that's that's. Uh, but yeah, I really want. I, I think anything. Like I mentioned, the community is so good about making our players or helping our players feel welcome and appreciated here. And so, if you want to watch practice, come on out. If you don't, don't worry about. It. But um, I think you'll, when you do come out, I think you'll see it's a great environment, and our kids are having a lot of fun. Hi. Uh, you briefly mentioned some of the challenges and excitements of joining the Big 12, and a big part of that is increased travel, especially to Cincinnati, Morgantown, and Orlando. Are you expecting that increased travel for some of these games to impact recruiting or retention at all? That's a really good question, and, and I would say a little bit unknown, just because we haven't had to do it yet. It's the same thing for the schools joining the Big Ten from the from the old Pac-12, right? Like, is it going to impact UCLA having to go play at Rutgers? I don't know. Am I going to care as a UCLA alum about them going to play at Rutgers? Probably not. Um, so you know, but I I will say that the the travel thing is just part of it, and so I do like the fact that most of our conference is not that far, right? There's a couple, but most of them are relative to going to Seattle or Washington, or I mean Oregon, or you know what I mean? So it's in terms of travel. So I feel a little bit better about that, right? Um, you know, taking the, the schools from the Pac-12 that, that kind of joined the Big 12, like all of those are easy regional games. BYU, the Texas schools, like so that those part of it, that part of it I think is, I think we fare a little bit better than maybe some of the other people that are going to go have to go across the country. And I feel for those players, I feel for those coaches, and I feel for those fan bases, right? If I'm, you know, I grew up one city north of Stanford, and I like, I feel bad for that they're going to have to go play Duke and North Carolina and Virginia and Florida State. Just, it's just, just a different, you know. Ho hopefully, at some point, we figure this out and we find a better way to move forward. Coach, let's make this NIL thing real. So you're looking for an edge rusher. What do we have to pay? That's a hell of a question. Uh, I, wow, that's a big question. I'm trying to figure out the right way to answer it. And I just saw Mr. Hansen to my left, so I'm just wondering, you know. Um, so yeah, off the record, yeah, no such thing anymore. Uh, like, I would say any player that's an impactful player on the Division One level is um, anywhere from fifty grand to a million bucks. And so it just depends on what the rap sheet says, like how good they've been, like what have they done, and then um, how bad you need it. You know, and that's the interesting part is it also different than the NFL. Like that market is set a little bit in terms of what people are paid. But what's happening in college football right now is if, say, um, I don't know, Fresno State has a guy that is in the portal and it's us and Baylor are trying to get him, we don't know how much Baylor's offering that kid, right? Like that's the hard part about it. Right, so the people that are having those conversations are trying to figure that out. Like, there's no way to, you know, they're like, oh, well, they're offering him this, and is that true? I don't know. Right, so it can be kind of a shell game that way as people are trying to figure it out. But I think our guys with our collective do a great job, and I think we're fortunate because they're all giving of their time, and that part of it is really special. You know, the guys that you know care about the U of A, went to school here all those things, and so I think that's special that, that we have people that love it that much that are willing to do that and have those conversations for us. Um, but the market is all over the place, and it, and it just depends on often who's competing with who and then how bad the need is. You mentioned yeah. that uh, 50 to a million. Uh, are there sign, do, do the players sign a contract for this or is it just, uh, well, here's this and, yeah. and uh, this is only for the coming season or what, what is, it, is that there, is it a four year deal or a one year deal or a two year deal, what is it? That's a great question. The, the beauty of it is that like the, I think it's like, it's interesting both ways. Is it like the contracts are being written by people outside of the football 
Like we have nothing to do with it. So they're being written by business people who are smart. So those business people are writing those contracts in smart ways, right? Um, you know, there like so many of things that are happening. I'm not sure where the intended uh, consequences by the NCAA and, and kind of the deregulation and where we're at. But you know, really intelligent business people are the ones making the decisions with these contracts with the young people. I do think there's some opportunity. Like if the young people don't have oper uh, have representation, they could get put in a bad spot too. You know what I mean? So um, I, th I think everyone's trying to be above board with it and do it the right way and make sure the players are supported and and everyone's kind of coming out of it with a fair deal. But I think it's complicated. Okay. Last question. What do we got? Hi, Coach. Um, <clears throat> what teams are the top teams in the uh, Big 12? Uh, I mean, I'll tell you in about eight months. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting because I think that I think the teams that – entered last year and then the four that are coming in from the Pac-12 are really interesting right um you know and not knowing you know a year ago TCU played for the national championship they were really good um you know like Baylor's played really good football over the last 20 years UCS been really good BYU's been good right Utah back-to-back -back Rose Bowls before this season right like that so there's like there's a lot of unknown to it too especially when you're adding in the last two years you'll be adding six new teams and so I think that's really interesting between UCF, uh, BYU, um, and then the four from the Pac-12. You know, so I, I don't know that we really know yet. I think it's a lot of speculation. Uh, but I'm excited. I think this is a great conference for us to be going into. I really do. I think, I think we're fortunate that way. I'm glad that we were able to take the four teams from the Pac-12, that they're part of this. I mean, obviously, all these things were done way before I got here. Uh, but just watching it from the outside in, I think like geographically, those things make sense. And you know that for them, that's for all of our student athletes. I think we have to think of them also. And what is that travel going to be like? For football, it's not bad. Tra football travel, you leave on a Friday morning, you get back Saturday night. You might get back at like or Sunday morning at three in the morning or something. But but it's a 36-hour thing. Uh, you know, like for the other sports, I think it's challenging. If you're a softball player or a baseball player, if you're a basketball player, you know you're going to be gone for three, four days. If you have like a swing on the east coast like i think some of those things are hard like you know in you know how do we fit the the model of student athlete in there i think those are all the big questions that like the world of college athletics and you know, we're gonna have to figure out thank you for having me you guys are awesome i think the warmth that you're giving to us is going to be reciprocated, absolutely. I think it's great. And I said, don't go away because. Um, now, the Rotarians know that we always give, uh, we donate a book to the Make Way for Books Library um, and signed by the speaker. And you're the speaker today. You guests don't know that. So that's exactly what we do. And this book is called Good Night Football. I'm a bit worried about that title. <laughs> However, we'll ask you to sign it and sign it on the back, and then we'll donate it. Now, is David Lovett here? I didn't see him, but he's a member of our club, and he's the president of Make Way for Books. So I'll give you this book to sign. Thank you. And uh, it's going to take a few minutes to close the meeting because it's been such a good one. But I want to thank all of you here and thank all the virtual guests for coming today. We have been looking forward to this meeting for weeks. <laughs> Trust me, we really have. You know, when we first heard you were coming, yay! No, he's not. Come <laughs> he's coming, yay! Will he make it? Yay! He's here! <laughs> Next time, talk about cricket, if you will, please. Um, for all of the, the guests, uh, please, if you'd like to make a donation to the scholarship cups, their blue cups on the table, the money goes to students at PCC and the U of A. Uh, we do support the scholars. We try to give them thousands of dollars each year. So thank you very, very much. And there's a slide that shows you what the cups look like. I want us all to give a huge round of applause and thanks to Mike Anderson and Micah, the family, yet again. No, absolutely, none of this false modesty. Fabulous, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
He was a president here before, and he deserves all the accolades. And talking about past presidents, we have one here, Bob Logan, who a few minutes ago talked about how he's been embarrassed by people telling him he shouldn't be wearing black but wearing red. So he did ask earlier if he could borrow my jacket for the photos. <laughs> you can borrow it. Wayne Meyer. Oh, fabulous. Thank you again for all that you've done for the club. And thank you to everybody who donated to that gift that you received. Oh, you're going to buy a lottery on your way home? Okay, did you buy a raffle ticket earlier on? Okay, good. Congratulations to our 2025 car show, Dave. Stand up, Dave. Yay, <laughs> fabulous. We're expecting about 250,000 from the next show. I mean, the 2025 aren't yours. Okay, and all, goes, all the money goes to local nonprofits. That's what you have to know. The guests may not know, but we have this car show every year, and we are giving, give or take, $200,000 per year to local nonprofits. So thank you for everything that all of you done for the car show. And thank you to Jen and Sean. And thank you for running up to the podium. Good on you. Uh, <laughs> thank you to the March Madness team, the coaches, and thank you, Vic, for heading this up, for getting it going. Uh, it's wonderful that you've done that. Thank you. And, of course, thank you to Brent Brennan. Best of luck in the upcoming season. Not that you need luck. You've got skill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finally, don't forget to stay for the club photo at the adjournment. Next week, uh, the, here, I think I heard somebody whisper, where are we going to do the photograph? Here, 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 here. And David, I saw you at the back there, David Lex, new member. He's a professional photographer. He's taking the photo. He's Dot Kret's son. Next week, Rotary Meeting, April the 3rd, we are going to welcome Carol Stewart, Vice President for Tech Parks Arizona. Uh, she's at the U of A, of course. Um, there we go. She's been to several of our meetings in prior years, and we'd love to entice her to be a member. And I think that's it from me. So it's toast and adjourn and photographs, and thank you again. Dan? The toast. <clears throat> it's not the will to win that matters. It's the will to prepare that matters. Here, here. Meeting is ended, and thank you all for attending, and thank you for all those who wore red. It was a great sea of red to see.